anybody else noticed that this world seems just a little bit messed up? Anybody else ever noticed it? I mean, if, if you haven't, you probably didn't look at the paper this morning or listen to the news or the radio or been on social media. I mean, you don't have to go far. You don't have to look all that hard to see that our world is just a little bit messed up. Now, here is the question. If God is all-powerful and God is good, then why is this world such a mess? It is one of the most challenging questions for people who want to believe in God but can't find a way to. So we we believe that God is all-powerful. In theological terms, we say that God is omnipotent, meaning he is omni, which is the word for all things, all, and potent, which means strong. God is omnipotent. He is all-strong. He is all-powerful. But if God is all-strong, God is all-powerful, God is all-good, why are there such terrible, awful, rotten, no-good things that happen to good people on a regular basis? You know, and, and to take it a step further, I run into a lot of Christians that, that will say things like, I, I guess that was God's will, or that's just God's plan. I was at a funeral several years ago for a family that had lost their child about 10 weeks in. He had a rare genetic disease. And, and one of the women at that church said, well, I guess God just needed that child more than the parents. I, I can't wrap my head around that picture of God. I I can't reconcile that kind of picture of God with Jesus, who is beaten, crucified, nailed to a tree, and He says, Father, forgive them. I can't reconcile that kind of picture of God with, with the Jesus who weeps over Jerusalem or the Jesus who weeps when His friend dies. I can't reconcile that kind of picture of God with the Jesus who says God is not willing that anyone should perish, that God came that, I, that you may have life and have it to the full. So here's the question that we're going to tackle today. If God's will is being done, why doesn't it look like it? Would you pray with me? Father God, this, this is a tough topic. And every one of us here can point to something that's happened in our lives. Whether we've lost someone, whether we've been through cancer or tragedy or sickness or or stood next to a family by a graveside wondering why. Why Why did they die so young? Why did this happen? Why isn't this right? So God, I pray that your spirit would be here. I pray, Lord God, that that you would change our hearts and that you would use us, this, to draw us closer to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people say, Amen. So I want to look at, at the prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, this is how you should pray. This is what Jesus says. He says, when you pray, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This morning I want to look at just one of the, the phrases that Jesus, one of the ideas that he has, and it's this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, let's unpack that just a little bit before we get back to that bigger question. All right, so Jesus prays, your kingdom come. What's what's he talking about there? I mean, in the simplest terms, a kingdom is the place and the people over which a king has authority. It's the places, the people over which the king has authority. So let's be really clear. If you're going to talk about the kingdom of God, pretty much everything, like meaning everything, is God's kingdom. This is what David prays in 1 Chronicles. He says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. Why? For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. All things, all space, 
all time, everything. If you can think it, if you can dream it, if you can wish it, that's God's kingdom. He has authority over that. God reigns over all creation and he reigns over all people. We are all subject to God's authority whether we acknowledge it or not. Here's what Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians. God exalted him, Jesus Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on heaven and on earth and under the earth, they will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There you have it. I mean, everything. Everything is under God's authority. Ultimately, everything, everyone will submit to his authority, even if they don't now. When you listen to Jesus talk about the kingdom of God and when the church talks about the kingdom of God, we tend to talk in, in different ways. See, the kingdom of God is future is when Jesus will create a new heaven and a new earth and we will spend all eternity. That's God's kingdom. But Jesus also talks about the kingdom of God being right now, right here in this place. Over and over again, if you read through the Gospels, Jesus will say say things like, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is now. Wherever people acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the kingdom of God is now. The church believes that the kingdom of God is spiritual. It's, it's inside of each and every believer, but the kingdom of God is also physical. Whenever people who believe in Jesus Christ do his will, the kingdom of God is here. So when we pray, let your kingdom come, what we are really playing, praying is, Lord, I want you to be the authority in my life. I want you to have authority. Like Brian talked about in the communion meditation, God, I want you to rule over this mess. It's not my mess, it's yours, so help me clean it up. We, when we pray, let your kingdom come, we're saying, God, let, let your light shine in this world. We're saying, let your glory be revealed today among your people. Let your will be done. So let me ask you, what, what is God's will? We sang earlier, God is good all the time. And I believe that's true. See, James, it says in James, every good and perfect gift, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. That's God's will. God's will is for you to have a life of fullness. Jesus says that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. He didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but that we might be saved through him. That's God's will. One time Jesus is is talking to his disciples and and he says, like, picture it this way. If If you want to think about God, picture it this way. Let's say there's a shepherd and this shepherd is a really rich shepherd. This shepherd has 100 sheep and one of them wanders off. Now, most normal shepherds are going to be like, eh, I still have 99. What's one sheep? I mean, I have 99 sheep. You know, some are male, some are female. They'll make another one. I'll be back to 100. It's not a big deal. Not God. God says, no, 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 no. My 99 are here. But I'm going to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to find that one. That's the heart of God. Jesus finishes that parable and he says, in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. God is not willing that any should perish, but all would come to repentance. Peter says it this way, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God wants all people to be in relationship with him. God wants all people to acknowledge Him, to bow their knee to Him. And it's not because He is this tyrant of a God who like, dwells on the, the worship of others. It's because we were created by Him to be in relationship with Him. You will never find full joy, full peace, full fulfillment, full contentment unless you are in relationship with God. That's what you were created for. God wants you to come to Him so that you might find fullness. Jesus says it this way, the thief, the thief comes to kill and destroy. 
I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. All right. Let's get back to um, that big question. See, there are, there are Christians, when bad things happen, that will give you that sort of pat answer and just say, I, I guess that's God's will. I just want to ask, is it really? Is everything that happens down here God's will? If it is, let me ask you this. Why does Jesus say, I want you to pray this way? Because when he starts that teaching, he says, don't pray like the hypocrites who just stand on a corner so everybody knows how good they are. Don't pray like the pagans who just babble on and on and throw out a bunch of useless words. Wouldn't these words be useless if God's will is already being done here on earth like it is in heaven? Wouldn't those words be meaningless? I mean, if God's will is already being done here the way that it is in heaven, why would we pray, God, um, do what you're already doing? Good job. Right? I mean, we, we don't get up in the morning and say, what I really want today is gravity. It's already here. See, I think God's will is not being done. Now, let, let me say a couple things. First of all, I believe that God is all-powerful. I believe that God can do all things. I believe that there is nothing that God could do, couldn't do. I believe that he could do all things. So if he wanted every single person on earth to do his will every single time, I believe that God could do that. But that is not the kind of world that God created because that's not the kind of God he is. That would be a tyrant, a dictator. See, God is relational. God works through relationships. Think about this. God exists from eternity as relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in the Christian faith in the Trinity. So we believe that there are three persons, one God. God literally can't do anything without working in relationship because God himself is relationship. God himself is in relationship from eternity. And if you start reading through the Bible, think of all the times that God doesn't step in and do it himself, but rather God works through someone. God taps someone else on the shoulder and says, hey, we have this issue, we have this problem, we need to solve it, here's what I want you to do. When, when God is frustrated and gives up, he thinks, you know what, we're going to do a reboot, and so he taps Noah on the shoulder and he says, Noah, I need a boat. It takes Noah years and years and years. God could have just snapped his finger and had a boat. God makes Noah get the animals. God could have just snapped his finger and had all the animals on his boat. When the people are in bondage in Egypt, God doesn't show up himself. He sends Moses. When he wants to call and create a people, he calls Abraham. says, hey, Abraham got something for you to do. When God wants someone to prepare the way for his son, he taps John the Baptist. When God wants to send his son into the world, he taps Mary. He could have just, he didn't have to do the whole birth thing. He could have just been like, poof, Jesus. I mean, think about this, right? I mean, I'm a little biased, but as good as the teaching is here at Discovery, imagine how much better it would be if God was like, hey, Andrew, you know, I know you've done a nice job and everything, but sit down, I'm teaching. Right? I don't think there's anybody here that's going to complain if Brian and I and Wayne take a seat so that God can preach himself. And he could do that, but he doesn't. That's not how he works. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians, we are God's fellow workers. Let that think, sink in for just a minute. If you've ever done anything with anybody else, right, which you're all here, so at the very least uh, you did something with your mom at some point, right, because you wouldn't be here otherwise. So you are in this world because of relationship. You exist today because of relationship. You're alive today because of relationship. You have worked with people, whether it's to keep your house clean or get it messy. You work with people to do it. God says, you know what? I need you. So that, that's how this works, because God is relational. We are God's fellow workers. All right, if you've got to go back to work tomorrow, I want you to think about that. You, you might work for the worst boss in the world, but I guarantee you already work for the best boss in the world, and you work with him. Here's the second thing. God is 
love. John says God is love. Not that God is loving, not that it is one of the characteristics about him. It's, John says that's the essence of who God is. From all eternity, God lives in relationship and God loves. Now think about it this way. If you want to have a loving relationship, there cannot be one person that controls everything. Because that's not a relationship, it's a monopoly. If you are in relationship, one person can't control everything. So here's the thing. We get to choose. We get to choose what we're going to do. We get to choose because love must be chosen. I want to do just a little bit of a, an illustration on this. Lauren, will you come up here? All right, so I, I dug really deep into my wife's purse this morning. Thank you. Here, I'll give you this. Uh, I don't need that bag. I, Lauren, I just, you know, you did a great job in this skit last week. I wanted to give you $5. It's yours to do whatever you want with. I mean, thank you. Just curious, what are, what are you going to do with my $5? Little army men. Oh. You know what, uh, Lauren, I, you know, I, I appreciate the little army men and everything, but um, I think I just gave you $5 in church, and now you're just going to go out and you're going to buy little warriors and promote, like, war and violence and, like, um, I, I don't think you should do that. Don't do that with my $5. Okay. So, so what are you going to do with it then? I'm going to buy a really little squid. I hate squid. I mean, I just I don't think that that would be an appropriate use of the $5. Maybe let's go to Subway then. Oh, five dollar foot long. Yeah. See, no, that, that's that's a good idea. Except, really, what a waste of five dollars. Why don't you just go home and get some bread and some of the meat that's in the fridge? I mean, you don't need to go to Subway. All right, give me that. If you're not going to do something constructive with the money I gave you and said you could do whatever you want with, you can't have it. Fine. <laughs> Here's the thing. God gives you choice and God gives you say-so, but if he's going to give you say-so, he's got to allow you to make foolish choices with your say-so. Even if it's little green army men. i got a bunch of them in my parents' house. You can have them, but a lot of the heads are gone and stuff. But. <laughs> See, regardless of how much it is, I mean, I, you can say, well, it's just $5. But what if it's 100 or 1000 or 10000 if you've ever had kids, you know what this is like, right? Because they, they move out, they start making choices, and sometimes you're like, oh, that, that is not a good choice. And yet they still get to choose. Unless they're living under my roof, and then it's my rules. <laughs> In the book of Joshua, it says this, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. God has given you the choice. You can use your say so, you can use your authority, you can use your gifts to serve him, or you can use your gifts to serve someone else or yourself. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now here's the amazing thing. In relationships, you have influence. Right? If, if you were to go to back 23 years and look at uh, the Andrew and Teresa that got married back then, um, they were pretty cool people. Don't get me wrong. But we are not the same people today as we were 23 years ago. And a, a big part of that is because we each brought something to the relationship. Now, I would argue that give and take, that back and forth, we are better people today because of it. But we are different. We have changed. We have influenced each other. That's how relationship works. Now, think about this. You have influence with God. I mean, you could go to the flip side, right? God influences us. Duh. But we also have influence with God. If you read through the Bible, there are a number of times where God has said, this is what I'm going to do. And someone comes to him in prayer and says, whoa, 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 whoa. And Lyle has influence. All right, I'll let you figure that part out. In Genesis 18, Abraham spares the city of Sodom. He pleads with God who is going to destroy the city and he says, wait, 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 wait. If I can find 50, no 20, no 10 people, will you save the city? And God relents. It's Moses who goes to God after the whole golden calf incident and says, God, you know what? Whoa, time out. I, I don't think you should just get rid of these people. Think about Jesus. Jesus' first miracle recorded in John. Jesus says, hey, it's not my time. Mom, I don't know why you're coming to me because they ran out of wine. It's really not my gig. 
Time's not now. And Mary says, you know what? Do whatever he says. And Jesus changes his mind. Jesus changes his mind. Performs his first miracle because his mom pleads with him. Hezekiah gets a longer life. We have influence with God. All right, so now the application part. And this is usually where people put the uh, outline in their bulletin away. See, we can influence whether or not God's will is done here on earth. We can use our say-so to bring about the kingdom of God in our lives, in our homes, and in our communities. Let me give you a couple thoughts. First of all, pray. Do what Jesus says and, and pray. Pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, may your, may your will be done. Align yourself with God's will. Align yourself with God's will. And I know sometimes you pray and you're like, ah, this doesn't seem like it's doing anything, but your prayer influences what's happening in the spiritual realm. It does. And God answers prayer. And when we join our voices together and pray for something, we can have an impact. Now, here's the thing. You may never know why a prayer isn't answered. You might be praying for a baby. You might be praying for health. You might be praying for a friend. And it might seem like God didn't answer, but you don't know. And that's uncomfortable. But in the book of Daniel, Daniel goes to fast and he starts praying. And for 21 days, he's fasting. He's not eating. And he feels like God's not answering his prayer. But that's when the angel shows up and he's like, Hey, Daniel, great news. God sent me 21 days ago. The moment you started praying, God said, Go. And I got hung up with another spiritual entity. God answered his prayer on the first day, but there are other things that we don't see because angelic beings who are cross-purposes with God get to use their say-so against God. We don't know why our prayers don't get answered sometimes. But here's what we do know. God is love. And He wants what's best for you. Second thing we should do is just do it. You ever had that that situation where you got that $5, maybe that foot long, and you come across someone who's like, hey dude, I I just need $5 to get something to eat. And you can't tell me I'm the only one that looked at my $5 and was like, hmm, is he going to buy alcohol with that? He is. I mean, why do that? Because I was going to go get Subway, and that, that's better. You know what? We don't know what's going to happen. But what we do know is we have a choice. And, and we can do the kingdom thing. That's our job. Our job is not to worry about, is it all going to work out in the end? Because God's already taken care of that. Our thing is just to do the kingdom thing and to serve our neighbor and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's it. That, that's our goal. So just, just do it. Serve your neighbors. Serve the people around you. Trust God to take care of the rest. And let me leave you with that. Trust God. And that's the hard part. But I promise you, He wants what is best for all of us. And take comfort, right? You might be here 80, 90, 100, 110, maybe 150 years if you're really, really stubborn. But when it comes in light of eternity, that is just going to seem really momentary. Here's the thing, if you haven't read the book, we win in the end. See, because in the final trumpet sounds, God is going to separate everybody and be like, everyone who who is bowing your knee, everyone who believes and wants to align their will with mine, over here we're going to call this heaven. And we will live for the rest of eternity living in God's perfect love and will. The next 80, 90, or 110 years might suck. But pray, act, and trust. Because we win in the end. Would you stand with me? We are going to end this message with Jesus' prayer. I want to do it together the way they would have done it in the early church. Let's lift our voices in unison to God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Stay standing as the worship team comes up to lead us in the last song.